Friends, we are so glad that you have joined us on this Sunday morning to worship together in community. My name is Laura. I'm Vaughn. I'm Lizzie. I'm Alex. And we'll be your worship leaders this morning. Let's continue in song together. Yeah, we 
If your face is down, take a look around. Do your fingers move? Do your lungs inflate? Are you tired? Are you weary of the hidden hate you've been holding? Hey, did you lose that love or have you never had it? Are you feeling sad because you did a bad thing? Good morning, friends, first time viewers, community members. We are so proud here at First Denton to bring you this safe, inclusive, virtual worship. And we want you to know that whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, whatever your story or identity, God's grace is here for you. And so are we. So welcome to the Mosaic Worship Community at First United Methodist Church of Denton. Also, we would like to invite you to sign in so that we can know you are here with us and so that we can know how to better serve you, our community. You can sign in at fumcdenton.com slash sign in. Now we invite you to continue worshiping with us this morning.
friends, today we're talking about plans. My story about plans comes from when I was in the Army. Each month I had counseling sessions with my sergeant where we would talk about my one, five, and ten year goals. This was before I accepted my call to ministry, and I argued with my sergeant each time we had one of these meetings because I never set a ten year goal. We were supposed to set goals so that we could begin to plan for them. In the thoughts of the military, good planning often leads to success. If you noticed, I did not say planning will create success. From from the moment we become conscious of goal setting, making plans, or even setting expectations for what will happen or how things will go in life, our plans, our expectations, and even some goals will never be realized. With everything that has gone on during this COVID pandemic, I think everyone can empathize with what it feels like when our plans fail. Our one-year goals turned into two or three. Our five-year goals into 10. And our 10-year goals into a, well, we'll see. Friends, today we'll be talking about God's plan for us which is shown in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, this plan is everlasting. It was formed at the beginning of creation. 
When we look at the creation narratives and also the prologue of John, we, we can see the work of Christ throughout eternity. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life, and the life was the light of all people. When our expectations are not met, when our plans fail, we as disciples of Christ don't forget the work that God does for us. We can look at the failures, the sorrow, and the disappointment as a new opportunity where we spring forward knowing that when all is said and done, there is one thing that always remains true, and that is God's plan for you. Let us pray. Lord, you are creator. You are the sustainer. You are the redeemer of all life. And for this, we thank you as we bask in your unending love for us. We feel sorrow when we know failure, when desperation hits its hardest. Help us remember you. It is in you that we place our hope, in you that we place our faith, and it is in Christ that we find our resurrection. Lord, in this life, there is both good and bad. We do not live without experiencing both, but when the time comes for resurrection, let your presence be known to us. Let your arms surround us and carry us to the new path that we will walk together. Lord, you alone are our salvation, both now and forever. Amen. And now, with the confidence of children of God, we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You are not hidden. There's never been a moment you were forgotten. You are not hopeless. Though you have been broken, your innocence stolen. I hear you whisper underneath your breath. I hear your SOS, your SOS. I will send.
Jeremiah 29, 5 through 7, 11 through 14. Hear now the word of the Lord. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm to give you a future with hope. Then when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me, says the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So my grandfather was a farmer, rancher, and builder. He worked in construction for most of his life before my grandmother and him decided to buy land and become real life farmers. And growing up, my grandfather, known as Papa, was always creating farming rice and soybeans. He built his own house and much of his local church. If you couldn't find him, he was probably the one on the roof fixing something. He created. And one day when I was about six years old in the hot summer months on the East Texas farm, my papa said, Laura, let's go on the roof. What? Uh, I shrieked. I'm scared. I was six and followed the rules. We can't go on the roof. Papa, it's not allowed. With me, it is. He took me tightly by the hand, my mom behind us, and we climbed up the roof. And at the top, he showed me all of his farmland, the barns, barns that he was building, and looked over at me and said, sometimes you have to do scary things, Laura, to see what you are building. Today, I was invited to tell my story. If you don't know me, my name is Laura, and I am a worship leader here at FUMC Denton for the Mosaic Worship Service. What you may not know is that my late husband and I, J.R. Bird, were hired here together as co-worship leaders in 2016. We were so excited for the opportunity to build a worship service that was open to really fun and eclectic music, with some people who were ready to build. But only two weeks after we began the job here, our life together took a really drastic turn. You can never be prepared for that moment when something in your life changes forever. I know you've seen it in the movies. You know what happens to people? Maybe something tragically unexpected has happened to your best friend's aunt or your colleague's father, but not to you, right? I mean, what are the chances? That's what we tell ourselves because the alternative is too scary because it's out of our control. The one thing the movies do get right, at least in my personal experience, is that time really does slow down. <laughs> When my late husband was checked into the hospital with pain in his lower abdomen, we thought it would be an overnight stay. And not until the doctor peeked into our room and asked to speak with me outside did I truly know something was wrong. Each step towards the door felt like a slow, heavy step towards doom. And as she was speaking, saying words like multiple tumors on his liver, possible liver cancer, tumor markers, I felt weak in the knees. Time slowed down and her words became long and deep and I leaned really hard on my mom to keep from falling on the ground. You can never be prepared for the moment when something changes your life forever. 
It was confirmed a few days later that he was diagnosed with advanced stage four colon cancer at the age of 35. He had two to five years to live. Suddenly, I was plunged into a world I did not know and did not want to experience. As Jared got his MRI to confirm the CAT scan, I sat in the cold, small, square waiting room alone, frantically Googling a stage four cancer and started reading. You can never be prepared for the moment when something changes your life forever. That was the beginning of our journey into the unknown. But thankfully, I had a partner that really liked to make dad jokes along the way. And I tried to smile. But inside, I was clinging to the hope that my God would somehow heal him. That my God would make a miracle happen just this once. And yet my prayers seemed to fall on deaf ears. He wasn't getting better. Okay, flashback a little. A few years after I graduated from my first master's at SMU Perkins, when Jer was still young and healthy, I went back with some seminary friends to the SMU versus Baylor football game. I hadn't seen my grad school friends for a while, and after Baylor beat SMU, sick and bears, we caught up over some late night sports bar food. Unlike the atmosphere around us bustling with TV screens of several different sports games and the smell of beer in the air, we, of course, being the seminary nerds that we are, started talking about, big shock, God. And the question up for discussion, have you ever heard God? We all went around the table and told our stories of how and when and why they felt that God spoke to them in some real way or even with an audible voice. And I admitted that I had not ever heard God speak in an audible voice, but that I had felt the oneness of creation in meditation, and that spoke to me. I had felt the connection, feeling of home when I took communion and knelt at the altar to pray. Many of my come to Jesus meetings in my own life happened on the altar where I took the bread and cup. For one, because it forced me to think on my spiritual life. But no, I never truly felt like God was speaking directly to me or I just wasn't really sure. I went home that night wondering if I ever would. Would I experience God in the same way as my fellow seminarians had claimed? Okay, back to our journey. Around 4 a.m. the same night, we learned about JR's condition. While he was finally asleep and comfortable at the hospital, my mom and I went back home to shower and pack a suitcase. As you can imagine, I was still in shock. In resignation and defeat, I took a shower and let the water run down my back as I wept. It's hard to stand here and explain what goes on in your thoughts when you are trying to process an emotion of a life change and possible loss of someone you love deeply on a soul level, someone you have built your life with. But honestly, my thoughts centered around one thing, and I kept saying it to myself over and over and over again. I can't do this. I told God then and there, you've got the wrong girl. I'm not the strong one. I'm the weak one. JR, he's strong. Let it be me instead. He can keep living without me, but me? I'm not strong enough. In that moment, these words hit me with full force. You are stronger than you can ever imagine. Was I imagining it? Was it just myself talking to myself? Why did I feel these words so strongly in my body and my mind as if on repeat, you are stronger than you can ever imagine? 
And as the warm water collided with my aching face from weeping, I knew, like it was written on my bones, that I was strong enough. I didn't know how I could possibly go down this path without breaking, but when I stepped out of the shower on that early morning, the darkness still clinging to the air, I vowed one thing. I will learn to be strong for him. And I knew for sure in that moment that I was not alone in the fight for life. We begin the journey of our life, a year full of pain, struggle, hope, and bittersweet moments. And while we're on this journey, my mom gave me this verse to remember, Jeremiah 29, 11. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. I put it in my kitchen and read it every day. God has plans for you. I remembered plans for hope and a future. And when I ate my lunch every day, God has plans for you, plans for hope and a future. And when I looked at his urn sitting on my side table the first year after his death, God has plans for you, good plans. And even though I didn't know what my future looked like, that verse had been imprinted on my heart. And it gave me the hope to keep moving forward every day, one step at a time. Isn't it amazing that words of wisdom from 2,500 years ago can still reach us today? Our scripture library is full of stories in which we see everyday people struggling with suffering and war, grief and loss. And in this particular letter, the prophet Jeremiah is writing back to his people who have been taken as prisoners by the Babylonians and exiled into a foreign land. It's safe to say as exiles of war, life wasn't a dream. But what was Jeremiah's advice in the face of uncertain woe? Was it to rebel and leave, to give up? No. He says, this is the time to live. Feet all in. And part of learning to live in this new, non-ideal state of the world was to accept what was happening in the present moment. They were in exile, with most of their leadership and captivity and their national treasures taken and still, Jeremiah tells them, it's time to plant, to build your gardens, your families, to prosper. And in seeking the welfare of your own people, you will in turn find peace. Plans, good plans I have for you. And I honestly think the translation of welfare here is a little tricky for us English speakers because the Hebrew word is actually shalom, peace. Seek the peace of the city, this life together, those around you, and you will find peace within. Look outward instead of inward at your own pain and suffering. God has plans for you. Good plans. Okay, it's a little easier said than done, Jeremiah. Thanks for the great advice, truly. But how does one build? How does one participate fully in life again and create something new when their own future has been taken from them? You can never be prepared for the moment when something changes your life forever. After Jair's death, I didn't really know how to function, but I was lucky enough to have a community of people here at this church that did what the church says it's supposed to do, love on those who need it the most. And friends, I needed support. With the urging and affirmation of my community, my countless church mothers like Rhonda Clark and Michelle Springer, my deep friendships I've made with those along the way, 
Mosaic leaders such as Georgian Burlage, Janine Murphy, Misty Gold, Kent Cargyle, and countless other friends who took food to my house when I was too tired to make it and made sure I had groceries in my fridge after every chemo appointment. That was this community. And we gathered here one year after his diagnosis and celebrated more than 400 people in our sanctuary to acknowledge his life and music. My life changed not only because I learned to take forward steps with the help of community, family, and friends, but once again, I knew I wasn't alone. Jeremiah's words echoed true, plant, build, live. I began to form deep friendships, like these two, who I sing with every Sunday, and I knew no matter what was going to happen during the week, I could show up on Sunday morning and they would be there for me. Every Sunday night, my friends Lizzie and Taylor and I watched a show called The Walking Dead. And once again, even when I didn't want to keep going, I had a reason to. The Mosaic community formed through and because of JR's music. We played his music every Sunday and even in larger church celebrations. And those who never even knew him formed connections with him through the love that I and others in the community continued to carry. Plant, build, live. The encouragement of Pastor Don Lee and Pastor Jonathan Perry, I started to meet with them to explore my pastoral calling further. They affirmed that I did have gifts for ministry and a pastoral heart. And approximately two and a half years after JR left us, I was passed as an official candidate for ordination with the United Methodist Church, one year into my Master of Divinity degree. Plant, build, live. Sometimes I like to process my sermons with my parents because they both went to seminary and are very good storytellers. And when talking over this sermon, my mom asked me, when was the moment you really decided to live? And honestly, I couldn't answer because there wasn't one moment. I had to decide to live every day. Every step forward, every moment of grief was a battle. And honestly, some days I just stayed in place and learned how to exist in a foreign world. I had to learn how to build again, how to move into a new house with my little family of one geriatric cocker spaniel and three very needy chihuahuas all of which were his idea, by the way. <laughs> and when you watch the movies of heroes and storybook endings, it's so easy to think that there was not deep and abiding pain and struggle because we only see the fruit of the labor. But it was the first decision to begin to plant that seed, not knowing where my life would lead. Brene Brown says that vulnerability, courage, bravery, all those hard things are really not about winning or losing at life because this isn't a Marvel movie, but about having the courage to show up when we can't control the outcome, having the courage to take the first step, to plant the first seed, to build without having a blueprint, to live joyfully in the present. Sometimes you have to do scary things to see what you are building. And through it all, I was never alone. Like the promise of the cross we receive on Easter Sunday, God creates new life through the ashes of death. If we lift our heads and open our hearts to all that life has to offer. Living the joyful life is about appreciating the life you are living here and now. Accepting that yes, bad things do happen to good people. And that still doesn't make God any less with us. Living a joyful life means accepting the good and the bad, the great joy and deep sorrow, and knowing through it all, you are a co-creator with the one God. There's an image of the weeping Buddha, a man sitting down, hunched over in sorrow. He represents a symbol of the grief and sorrow of the whole world. 
And when we are in grief, depressed, anxious, when we cannot see the light of the new day ahead, we tend to turn inward. We become so inward looking, obsessed with our own hearts, even if we think we hate ourselves that we cannot see the grace of God that has covered us from the very beginning of creation, the same grace that allows us to lift our head from our own self-obsession and become aware that we are here to find the beauty in this life that the Creator has bestowed upon us, that we have the ability to plant and build and live and find shalom within the creating. About six months into JR's last year, he had to spend a couple weeks in the hospital due to an emergency surgery. And that's when we began the late night tradition of our sessions outside the hospital. See, the thing about JR and I was we were night owls and my parents even had a term they used for our definition of time on this later than normal schedule, bird time. He often got home late to gigs, so we didn't go to bed till 2 or 3 a.m. And the hospital, a very hard place to find joy or peace with beeping machines and horrible lighting, kind of harshed the late night hangs. So every night, the night nurses would let us sneak down to the front of the hospital and take a little stroll, tubes and all. They would wave with a, have fun and we would stroll in front of the hospital in the stillness of the night, his hospital gown just gently waving in the wind with full abandon, of course. And those nights are what I remember fondly, because those nights we were happy. We would talk about life, eat junk food from the hospital vending machines. We'd sit on the bench and listen to the wind and hold hands. One night, as we sat, I asked him a pretty hard question. Are you scared of dying? He paused for a moment to think. He always had a knack for saying the most profoundly simple wisdom. And if someone had asked me that, I would have first expanded upon the purpose of life and the vulnerability of looking in the face of death without fear something like that. But JR liked to keep it simple. He breathed in a shaky breath and nodded. A little. But mostly I'm just glad I got to live. With that he shrugged his shoulders, stood up, reached out his hand and said, you coming? We still have to watch the last season of Orange is the New Black. (laughs) I laughed and then we laid in the tiny hospital bed together and watched Netflix. And I honestly couldn't have been happier. I know this story is bittersweet because when we love deeply, we grieve deeply. And I will carry the loss for the rest of my life. But my motivation to live a life full of joy and peace and love in a way that would make him proud outweighs any motivation to stop living. I'm just glad I get to live this life. And as it turns out, I am stronger than I ever imagined. By the grace of God lifting my head up to show me what was around me the whole time, I found the joy of a life lived. Joy of a life worth living. My grandfather was right. Sometimes you have to do scary things to see what you are building. Now, although he too is gone from this world, I imagine us on top of the roof together again, him still holding my hand tightly, but this time, I'm showing him all that I am planting, building, and creating. I have a feeling he would be proud. God has plans for you, friends, for hope 
and a future. Good plans. Thanks be to God. Amen. We come now to our time of offering, where we give back the gifts that God has bestowed on us. Hear the good news. The tomb lies empty. Christ is sent to fill up the lives of the living. We have risen up in our new mission in following Christ. We are resurrected in our purpose and renewed in our desire to live and love like Jesus. It is in God's name, the fulfillment of God's kingdom, that we find the joy in giving what we have for the benefit of the other. Every Easter, we collect a special offering that extends to the global body of Jesus Christ. This year, any money collected in this Easter offering will go to the Costa Rica Methodist Church. Hearts for Homes, a nonprofit Christian outreach providing hope and dignity through the home rehabilitation, affording low-income seniors, ages 60 and older, a safe, comfortable, and well-functioning home through the Peace with Justice Initiative of the United Methodist Church's General Board of Church and Society. Thank you for your generosity that makes a difference in the lives of so many, both near and far. To give to this Easter offering, visit the link fumcdenton.com and select Easter Offering from the drop-down menu. Thank you for your continued generosity.
Hey church family, my name is Crystal and I'd like to share some upcoming opportunities to connect here at the church. Through the month of April, our church is collecting diapers and supplies for the Denton County Friends of the Family Diaper Depot. They are in great need of diapers sizes four through six, so these are the only sizes that we're collecting. These can be brought to the church or purchased through Denton County Friends of the Family's Amazon wish list and delivered directly to them. Visit fumcdenton.com slash community to learn how to participate, and thank you for shining God's love into every life. Today is the last day to order a delicious pie from the United Methodist Women's Pie Sale. Choose from apple, cherry, coconut cream, buttermilk, and pecan pies, and pick them up from the church on Saturday, April 17th from 11 to 1. All proceeds will go toward the empowerment of women, children and youth around the world. So head to fumcdenton.com slash UMW to pre-order your pie today. Also, if you'd like to learn more about who we are, please visit us online at fumcdenton.com slash beliefs. If you're interested in becoming a member, we invite you to visit fumcdenton.com slash membership. And now please join us for our closing song. Friends, I leave you with these words that I so often listened to while I was going through the depths by songwriter Will Reagan. I can't pretend to know the beginning from the end, but there's beauty in the life that's given. We may bless and we may curse every twist and every turn. Will we learn to know the joy of living? Blessings to you through God, the Creator, God, the Son, and God, the Holy Spirit. Amen.
always feels like I am losing, losing. You are here, I feel it too. That's the price of being human, human. Fear is contagious, but you are the cure. You don't need to hide when you feel insecure. No, no, no. The foundation is shaking, but I stand my ground. You're whispering lies, but I'm not backing down. No, 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 no. Part of this life, part of this life, it's worth the fight. It's worth the fight. Living in this messy world, but together we can climb. Together we can.